And we're back. Welcome to the 2021 York Festival of Ideas, our 10th anniversary. The traditional symbol for a 10th anniversary is tin or aluminium, as it symbolically demonstrates the toughness and durability of a relationship. And that feels particularly appropriate after the year we've all had. We're so proud at the University of York that we've created a festival that has positively engaged with literally thousands of people of all ages over the past 10 years. I am beyond grateful to all of our sponsors and especially our headline sponsor, the Holbeck Trust, our partners and our donors who have enabled us to fulfil our ethos to educate, entertain and inspire audiences by delivering so much of our programme for free. We believe no one should be excluded from the fantastic world of education and ideas. It feels totally appropriate that the theme for our 10th anniversary is exploring the idea of infinite horizons after a year where so many people have felt their horizons have shrunk to the size of a Zoom screen. We want to reignite discussions about the importance of collaboration and conversation across neighbourhoods and national borders. COVID-19 has really surfaced conversations about how society functions, how we can work to find new solutions to old problems. And in that context, the York Festival of Ideas is honoured and delighted to play a small part in driving those conversations, to showcase innovation and ingenuity, to spotlight difficult, complex issues that will require multilateral solutions and to create opportunities for sharing different lived experiences, different opinions, and different cultures. And so it feels particularly appropriate that we bring this day of celebratory anniversary events and begin with three incredible women, Brooke Masters in conversation with Mariana Masakata and Kate Pickett, a conversation that starts with a simple premise. How do we create, how do we recreate the philosophy and actions required that took a man to the moon to reframe how we tackle major social challenges like climate change, economic and health inequalities, and in doing so, deliver a purpose fueled agenda. As a university and a festival driven by the idea of public good and social purpose, this feels like the most important conversation to have. So let me hand over without further ado to Brooke Masters, Chief Business Commentator and Associate Editor of the Financial Times, to introduce our very first event of the 2021 York Festival of Ideas. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brooke Masters, the Chief Business Commentator at the Financial Times. We are absolutely delighted to be welcoming both Professor Mariana Mazzucato and Professor Kate Pickett today. A quick note before we start. If you'd like to purchase a copy of Mariana's new book, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism, or Kate's books, The Spirit Level and The Inner Level, copies are available from our partner bookseller at foxlanebooks.co.uk forward slash festival of ideas. First, we will hear from Mariana, who is a professor in the economics of innovation and public value at University College London. She currently advises the World Health Organization, the South African and Scottish governments, and the United Nations. I'm delighted she's had time to join us. Please welcome Mariana. Thank you, Brooke. And thank you to the York Festival of Ideas. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. I'm just going to share my screen. This is the hard bit. It's when you try to make sure everyone doesn't see your emails. There you go. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is really to talk about, um, well, my recent book, but especially why I think we all should really be rethinking how we do capitalism. There's different ways to do capitalism. We've got the wrong way but really learning on the ground kind of what works, what doesn't, and to scale up those uh, ways of building what I will call symbiotic and not parasitic partnerships, and especially really investing within the capacity of the state itself to find ways to partner with business and other actors in order to solve the biggest problems of our time. And you know, the biggest problems of our time, I think the whole COVID-19 moment is one that has just shown us how badly prepared we are, you know, whether it was the test and trace system, which in the UK was actually outsourced to Deloitte, uh, whether it's the digital divide, all these kids locked down at home and not actually having access to their human right to education, whether it's the failure of actually rolling out the vaccine. It's not enough to have a vaccine, but rolling it out globally, because that's the mission, a globally accessible vaccine, 
you know, countries, I think, have really found themselves ill prepared. And we shouldn't be so uh, surprised. You know, there's other crises, there's multiple crises that we're living through, and we seem to go from one crisis to another. But, you know, the global warming crisis, which Greta Thornburg, when she was 16, told us all, you know, what do you do when your house is on fire? Do you sit there and debate? Or do you get out? <laughs> uh, well, we're not getting out at all. We're just not moving at pace. We're still uh, globally investing in all sorts of different fossil fuel-based industries. In fact, in 2019, the EU actually provided $55 billion worth in subsidies to fossil fuel companies. And even the COVID-19 uh, recovery funds, something like 56% of those allocated to G20 countries have actually gone again to industries and sectors that are simply not the kind that we need for a green transition. So we're not moving at scale and we're absolutely not focusing enough on the actual capacity that's required on the ground in order to solve these problems. And hence we keep going from crisis to crisis. And it's not surprising, something I've been saying now for years is that we need to rethink the state, not because the state is more important than any other actor, but in fact, because the economy itself has not just a rate, but also a direction, and in order to direct our economies and our societies to actually be more inclusive, to be more sustainable, it's impossible to do that through this very siloed lens that economists have managed to convince global bureaucrats that we need for policy, which is at best policy is there to fix different types of market failures. And I'm not going to go over the whole market failure theory, but basically it's about putting bandages in the system whether it's putting you know, government investment in areas that the private sector doesn't invest in, like R&D, or taking away that investment in the private sector through carbon taxes due to negative externalities. All these market failures exist, but you can't patch your way, fill the gap your way to transforming an economy. And actually, this is what we require to solve these crises. We need massive economic transformation. In the UK, for example, Growth continues to be consumption-led, not investment-led. That consumption is fueled by private debt. So the ratio of private debt to disposable income is back at the level it was just before the, the, the financial crisis, and that's what caused the financial crisis. You know, that, these are just signs we are simply, again, you know, patching up the system, whether it's a financial patch-up, a climate patch-up, a health patch-up, and that's not going to help us. So at worst, we're told, you know, the Reaganite, Thatcherite, Thatcherite uh, idea of get out of the way, no government, but at best, at best we hear fix different types of market failures, patch your way up. And the problem is both of these are incredibly ill-informed. And what was really interesting in COVID-19, at least in the UK, is that there was a, a, a comment made by a Tory Lord Agnew, who said, you know, we've actually reduced government capacity to govern. Uh, he looked at all the consulting fees that were coming in uh, for, for, for government, both for Brexit and for COVID. And he argued that what he was seeing was really a reduction of government capacity, that it was being infantilized by this over-reliance on uh, uh, different types of companies to do really what government should be doing, or at least managing a process that government should be managing. So, you know, this idea that actually we have huge problems out there, but then we don't actually have the capacity on the ground to govern and solve those problems is something that, that I focus on in this book. And by the way, I also talk a lot about the private sector, which I think has been overly financialized over the last kind of half century. We have $4 trillion worth in S&P 500 companies having been spent just on buying back shares to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. This is sort of the backdrop, right? But I really profoundly think that unless we rebelieve that government has a role to play beyond fixing market failures, we won't even get those kind of real transformations we require in the business community itself, which um, I'll talk about later can actually come out of new types of conditionalities in order to foster this greater symbiosis between government and the state, but sorry, government and, and business. So what I do in the book is I look back actually 50 years ago at what got us to the moon. You know, that was hard. That was much harder than delivering personal protection equipment to frontline workers, which we continue to fail to do. Um, it, it's actually easier to get to the moon than solve some really big problems that Kate uh, has been talking about in terms of inequality. But looking at what it required in terms of government capacity, I think is incredibly important. And when, you know, Kennedy set out that mission 
which was, by the way, not just going to the moon, but getting back. <laughs> uh, it wasn't enough just to hang out up there uh, and to do it quite quickly in a generation. He talked about the need to take risks. He said it was going to cost a huge amount of money. They might fail along the way, as they did. You'll remember the Apollo 1 fire, that you know it would cost a lot of money, but less than we spend on cigarettes and cigars every year. But that idea that it was worth it, that we're doing it because it's hard, not because it's easy. A real kind of you know, a, a key point in the book is we simply don't talk like that anymore. Imagine if we said we were going to you know, fight global warming because it's hard, not because it's easy. And the level of experimentation, that willingness to take risks within the civil service, you know, they had no idea how to get to the moon when Kennedy made that speech. There was all these different ways. They finally decided on the lunar orbit rendezvous but also that need to look within the state, within NASA, to change its organizational structure, to be more flexible, agile, creative, in order to be purpose-oriented. This map here that you see was um, from George Mueller, who came from Bell Labs after the Apollo 1 fire, precisely to foster that greater level of communication, which one of the astronauts who died on the tragic day of the Apollo 1 fire, Gus Grissom was saying, how the hell are we gonna to get to the moon if we can't even talk between three buildings? Because he couldn't hear what was being said. So that need for organizational cultures to change, to welcome experimentation, to foster all sorts of different spillovers across many different sectors. So you're not focused on a sector, whether it's aeronautics or something else, but focus on a problem that brings lots of different sectors together, nutrition, electronics, materials, to solve a problem, getting to the moon and back. And, this is just a, a list of different types of innovations that we wouldn't have had without that uh, um, mission. But one of the things I focus a lot on, coming back to my opening uh, point, is that it wasn't just the state, it was also business. But how they worked together was incredibly interesting. And I think we need to, to, to build on the lessons there. So NASA, first of all, was very clear that they needed to partner with business, but how they would partner need to be designed in a particular way. So they changed their procurement contracts away from cost plus, where they were just getting billed for, for high uh, cost, to fixed price, like a, like a prize scheme, with constant incentives for innovation and quality improvement. Right, And that's actually what got us all those different types of spillovers uh, along the way. And they also were clear that they themselves had a really important role. They themselves were investing, the state was investing. So how you know, the profits were distributed had to be taken care of. And so they, they talked about things like no excess profits in their procurement contracts, uh, which is very interesting if you think of what we're seeing today in the space sector, where you have uh, billions being made by the latecomers like Elon Musk or Richard Branson on the back of huge types of public investments, as opposed to, again, a more mutualistic, collectively uh, organized um, mission. They were also very clear that they themselves had to be smart, right? That if NASA didn't invest in its own capabilities, it wouldn't even know how to partner with business. So this is a statement here made by Ernest Brackett, the head of procurement, who said, this is about, you know, us also having capabilities in order precisely to know how to partner with the business sector. And if we don't do that, we'll just get captured by what he called brochuremanship, which is exactly what Lord Agnew talks about when he says that the government has become infantilized. So I'm running out of time. I just want to finish with saying that for me, you know, this idea that government needs to itself be capable in order to partner with business, that we need to be thinking about big problems. And the problems that are out there, by the way, we've decided globally are the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Every country, the UK, South Africa, Brazil, we've all signed up to these goals. These are broad challenges that can be transformed into moonshots, into missions, whether it's a carbon neutral city, whether it's getting the plastic out of the ocean. But what does it actually mean for government capacity? What does it mean for public-private partnerships? This is something that I'm sure Kate and I will talk about also in the Q&A um, that really requires um, different types of public-private partnerships focused on, on problems, right? So in Camden, for example, we're looking at this notion of missions housed within, uh, well, housing estates, right? I mean, what does it look like to have a carbon neutral housing and sustainable living? What does it mean to bring citizens to the table in order to even talk about that? So it's not just led by academics, businesses, and, and policymakers. In Sweden, by the way, they thought of something really cool, and this will be my last point, um, which is what does it mean to, to bring carbon neutrality inside schools through school meals, right? So to bring, again, school children and students to the table to design those school meals, but to have that really as a lever for innovation for a sustainable agenda. So both that 
that point about participation, but also a goal orientation and to have the policies themselves focused on the problems as opposed to just giving money out to random sectors, random technologies or random types of firms is what I think would be really useful if we're gonna get serious about uh, achieving the SDGs as opposed to just talking about them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mariana. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce the University of York's Kate Pickett, who is a professor of epidemiology in the Department of Health Sciences. And until recently, she held the title of research champion for justice and equality. She's a fellow of the RSA, a fellow of the UK Faculty of Public Health, and she is co-founder and trustee of the Equality Trust. Kate, over to you. Thanks so much, Brooke. And oh, it's great to be here with, with Mariana as well and be on the same sort of platform. Um, I mean, my response to Mariana's new book is, is, is one of great joy actually to see somebody writing about the importance of purpose and the, the importance of vision and the importance of big ideas and the idea that you know if we work effectively and, and develop the right capacities and capabilities we can actually tackle grand challenges and, and serious problems and to feel that sort of positive optimism I think is really important and I was struck by um, what you said at the start, Mariana, about the COVID-19 moment. You know, this is a very particular moment at which we take stock and we start to think about how we do things differently. And it's been a really interesting year to be an epidemiologist. I um, mean, to start with, people actually know what one is now um, much more than, than they ever did before. And people understand the notion of an epidemic and of, of a pandemic I think what people have yet not grappled with is this notion that actually we're in the middle of a series of pandemics um, and COVID's just one of them. You know, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic of air pollution and that's having a devastating effect on the health of the public across the planet. We, we're in the middle of a pandemic of depression, a pandemic of obesity. And of course, if we think about the health of the planet, then we're certainly in, in crisis pandemic mode around loss of biodiversity and all kinds of other planetary boundaries. So this really is the time. It's the time to be thinking about what have we been doing wrong? Um, what have our blinkers been? Why have, why have we been stuck and unable to respond to all of these different problems, which do require grown up, joined up government? You know, why, why have we been so, so poor at it? And I think, you know, from, from my perspective and, you know, my work with, with Richard Wilkinson, what we see is that neoliberal capitalism, late stage capitalism has been an engine for producing vast inequalities that have had knock on effects that they themselves have created problems in the public's health that left us very vulnerable to something like an epidemic. Problems with human capital development, you know, wasting vast, vast um, human potential by the inequalities present in our educational systems, um, by our failure to provide engines of social mobility, and, and real problems in our relationships with one another, the way we trust one another or work together, um, the relationships of trust between public and private sector, um, between people and government. We've really, through allowing inequality to, to grow so, so large and so stark, we've really fostered um, a pandemic of all of those problems that have meant here we are sort of stuck and just fighting to respond to a problem that we were woefully unprepared for. Um, and yet at the same time, suddenly we've seen that our government, when it puts its mind to it, can spend, um, can be active, can do things, um, and can think big. And so there's a hopefulness there, I think, about um, how we move forward and what we need to tackle and, and, and the kinds of ways we can do it. And I think this COVID moment is very different to the global financial crisis moment where we thought things would get better. Um, we thought there'd be no turning back. We thought we would build back better then, and we didn't. I think there's a lot more recognition now that that was a wasted moment and that COVID, the pandemic, makes us think again that we need to do things differently. But perhaps because 
we had that lost opportunity following the global financial crisis 2007 to 2009. Perhaps we've now sort of consolidated our thinking enough to be able to, to push things forward. Um, I'm thinking of how many good things I'm seeing across the world, um, commissions, panels, um, groups of people coming together, thinking about how they can do things differently. And I'm seeing it at multiple levels, a lot at international level, um, a lot of things going on in Europe and the European Commission, for example, really taking on board ideas about social value and the green economy as they seek to sort of move forward post pandemic. But also locally, um, Mariana mentioned um, Camden, and I've been working for the past six months in Greater Manchester, trying to help them think about how do they recover from COVID in a way that is inclusive, um, that tackles inequalities and that creates a better future for everybody. So there's a lot of energy across the world and there's a lot of energy in different places and at different levels. And at the heart of it, I think, is this notion that if you want to tackle those big challenges, if you want the kind of mission that put people on the moon, then, then you do need all the talents to come together to do that. And you do need to, to do that by not addressing things at a top-down level, but, but fostering inputs from all kinds of different levels. And in my work in Greater Manchester, I think what I've been most sort of woken up by is the um, creativity and innovation and the ideas that were coming up from all of the engagement we did with groups of members of the public or um, from the social enterprise sector or from the local economic partnership. Um, so these aren't, aren't ideas coming from civil servants, they're not ideas coming from academics, they're not ideas coming from politicians, but they're ideas coming from people who live in places and can think about how to change things to make things better. And yet they're shackled. Um, they have no, no power, um, no tools to be able to do that. And so as soon as we start being more participatory in our decision making, more participatory in our development activities, as soon as we start doing more things from the bottom and sharing our ambitions, then I think we start to grow capability and grow capacity and grow creativity in ways that help us tackle the big things. I love the idea that we have missions as if back in the day we were going to go to the moon. And when I think about some of the things that need tackling in our society, like social care, that's as big a problem probably as thinking about how you put a man on the moon. Um, or tackling the kind of health inequalities that exposed us so badly to that high level of excess deaths from, from COVID. Or tackling homelessness and the housing, the quality housing problem in this country. Tackling obesity. Um, those are problems worthy of a mission on the scale of trying to put a man on the moon. And so I think it's really exciting to have this new book from Mariana and these ideas about the kinds of partnerships you need to build to make that happen, the kind of vision you need to have to, to put that in place and who needs to be at the table and how they need to be engaged. For me, putting equality at the heart of that recovery is going to be really important and putting equality at the heart of recovery and well-being as a target for society, that I think starts to help you orient towards the kind of society you want to create and the kind of place you want to be. But I think it's about us shaping and co-creating that vision with the people who will benefit from it. And it means bringing everybody to the table who, who needs to be involved. So it's really, an exciting time, I think, to be thinking about the future. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation um, that we have with you, Brooke, and the questions and answers that have come in from, from members of the audience. So I think I'll stop there and, and let's, go, let's go into some more discussion. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, and welcome back, Mariana. Um, you both put together really interesting 
theor mostly theoretical ideas of, of how to fix our, our world and our government and our society. I think it'd be helpful for readers to talk about this on a somewhat more practical level. How do we rebuild government capabilities and rethink the way we work with the private sector? Mariana, you mentioned school lunches in Sweden as a sort of quick example, but can you give us some sort of more detailed uh, instances where you've started to see this work? Sure. I mean, in the UK back in 2017, I found myself often in the ministry that seems to constantly change its name. Currently, it's Business Environment and Industrial Strategy, uh, talking to Greg Clark about how can we actually implement this idea a kind of mission-oriented thinking around the industrial strategy, which up until then, even by the progressives in the government, like Vince Cable, had just been a list of sectors to finance. So at the time, it was aerospace, automobiles, financial services, life sciences, and the creative sector. Don't ask me how I remember that. I don't remember what I did yesterday. <laughs> anyway, so to go away from a list of five sectors to problems, right? So what the UK government did on the back of some of these conversations we had which was you need a challenge-led industrial strategy, focus on the big problems in the UK. What they did was actually to choose four big challenges, which at the time were clean growth, healthy aging, uh, future mobility. And the fourth one was a bit odd because it was more like a sector and a general purpose technology, but the power of AI, artificial intelligence and data. But if you think of that as the power of that to transform also our health services and the way the state operates, that itself can become really interesting challenge. And what we did on the back of that, Lord Willits and I actually set up a commission um, about what would it look like to then transform these four challenges to be kind of, again, moonshots. And one of the interesting things around the future of mobility, we transformed it into a very concrete plan around you know, the UK not just being competitive around future mobility areas, but actually solving problems like having a mobility system which was 100% accessible by people with disabilities. So what does it mean then in terms of fostering bottom-up innovation by all sorts of different sectors, including those, you know, thinking about disabilities, to be part of your industrial strategy? Again, problem-focused, not sector-focused. Another example, again, coming back to Camden, I mean, you know, some of the problems we're facing in London, and, and this is actually across the UK and across the world in terms of the extreme inequalities we have, have to do with youth crime. And a lot of the, you know, kids in London currently literally stabbing each other to death. You know, what does it mean to really use that itself as a mission? Zero knife crime. Why not zero? You know, teenagers in their school uniform should not be showing up to, you know, the Royal London Hospital, which has literally become, as you can hear um, the head of the hospital, Martin Griffiths, talk about a wartime kind of hospital. You have, you know, doctors stitching up these kids in school uniforms. If you look at the kind of things that Kate has been writing about, but also Michael Marmot, around the social and economic determinants of health, so the social and economic determinants of crime, what does it look like to provide kind of a public health lens to a problem as specific as knife crime in London and get as many different sectors and actors in the economy, public, private, third sector, civil society organizations, but also literally see it through an industrial strategy lens, because lots of different sectors, even an industry could become part of that, to solve a problem. The, the issue is that's not how we think about government policy. It's literally just a handout machine, you know, subsidies, guarantees, loans, bailouts. You know, these, this is just money wasted. And lastly, I'll just say, you know, something that Kate said, which is really important. We really missed out with the financial crisis. It could have been an awakening moment. We poured trillions, literally trillions into the financial system in order to save capitalism. So government did save capitalism from falling apart. But most of that money ended up back in the financial sector. What we need to do now is make sure that the trillions, because it is trillions, just look at the U.S. stimulus, it's, it's going to be more than $4 trillion, being poured into the system has to land in places like global health systems. You know, had this crisis begun in Africa and not in China, which has a much weaker health system than China does, we would all globally be worse off. So what does it look like to take that? You know, you're only as healthy as your neighbor on your street, in your city, in your, in, in, in your nation and globally as a way to rethink the welfare state. You know, global health systems is about the welfare state. And unfortunately, I don't think we're getting there, but you know, with people like Kate to myself and you and others, hopefully that's what's gonna happen in terms of steering this recovery in the right way. I was also struck by Kate's reference to the mistakes made after the 2008 crisis. Kate, on a practical level, you know, given your work in Manchester, 
what are you doing to get from the ideas to actual you know programs on the ground so that we don't just all wave our hands and and it all goes away and you know five years from now we say oh wow that was a wasted opportunity yeah um it's interesting isn't it in a, in our commission we were really focused on making recommendations that would be feasible um and that would make a real difference and one of one of the members of our commission um said it's not enough just to provide that vision of where you want the train to go. You've got to lay the tracks down so that you can get out of the station and you can you can make progress towards it. So one example was, you know, we kept meeting people who said, you know, they could describe the problems in their neighbourhood. You know, they might describe um, rundown buildings, um, empty shops, there's vermin, things are falling apart, it's dirty, it's not nice, you know, it's not it's not a good locality. And who would then have great ideas for businesses that they could set up if they just had a bit of investment or if they just had a bit of support. They'd say, you know, I could take over that empty space and I could put in a great little business making healthy lunches for, for people who work nearby. Um, but I don't know how to do it. So one of the things we recommended was that communities need to have um, community based hubs where you can get that kind of advice. How do I set up a small business? How do I make it a social enterprise? How do I set up something that that is a democratic kind of company? How do I create a mutual? How do I create a co-op? How do I network with other businesses like me so that collectively we can perhaps advertise together or go after um, procurement contracts that that normally would go to, to a bigger firm? So that kind of advice needs to be local. It needs to be there. It needs to be given to you by somebody who looks like you and sounds like you and understands the neighborhood you're coming from and the problems you want to tackle. But those um, those hubs need to be accompanied by investment hubs that are local as well. And there are lots of investors in the UK who, who are looking for opportunities to help create business in places like that. Um, And some members of the public were actually able to save during the crisis and now have have excess funds. What if they could all join together to invest in things locally? So we had an idea about um, business hubs, but but not business as usual hubs in communities and community investment hubs as well. So that feels like a very sort of practical way to, to then foster um, the translation of people's great ideas into reality on the ground. But I was also struck by the food, the school food <laughs> one, because we have a new project at the University of York. It's called Fix Our Food, and it's focused on trying to get the food system in Yorkshire both um, sustainable and healthy. And one of the things we're trying to do is change school food so that school food is good for you and delicious and is linked to regenerative farming in the locality and is not creating waste. So it's, it's changing the whole system. And you can't do that unless the kids eat the food. So we're involving the children from the start in what they want that sort of system to look like. So it's not just happening in Sweden, it's happening in Yorkshire as well. Um, and I think it's, it is about getting practical and it is about thinking what, what's the right level at which you pull the levers. And Marianne's right, you know, the global health system has to be sound, else we will all suffer from the next pandemic. And there will be another one. And, and it's quite likely that, that it will have, you know, different characteristics to this one. But how, how do we get ready for it? The global health system matters, but sometimes it is the local that matters. And I'm afraid that for me at the moment, I don't know about you, Mariana, but I'm, I'm, I'm encountering a lot more enthusiasm and engagement and capability at local level, at city region level, at local authority level than I am in national government at the moment. This actually seems like a great moment to bring in a question we have from the audience. Um, Arthur's written in to say and to ask, looking at the need for global um, collaborative international planning on health. 
do you guys think that that what we've learned in COVID is actually going to translate into that badly needed collaboration across national and international lines um, or not? And, and he's interested in what both of you think about this. Maybe I, I can just answer that through the, the question also that Kate just posited with, which is, is it just about local initiatives? Because I think partly it is. And um, I just luckily have a pile of books near me. And one of them is our Manchester um, report that both of us contributed to. And, and, and what we did there was actually to focus on the citizen. Like literally, as you wake up in the morning to when you go back to bed, what does a carbon neutral life look like? And what is the role of citizens in terms of actually participating in that agenda? The Swedish model, by the way, started at the very high level. It was a national agenda. Uh, about a carbon new, actually a fossil free welfare state. And the idea was what does it mean for public transport, public health, you know, public education. And that's why it then went down to the school level and brought kids and students to the table in fostering what was meant to be a healthy, uh, tasty and sustainable school food agenda. If it ain't tasty, baby, they ain't gonna taste it. <laughs> if, it's, if it's Ikea meatballs, I don't know. Anyway, um, I haven't had Ikea meatballs for a while. We haven't been shopping, have we? Um, but so I think we need to be careful because the skepticism around the national, and, and this is coming to the question, or the skepticism, which unfortunately is hurting the United Nations about big multilateral uh, kind of institutions, I think hurts the kind of agenda that Kate and I are talking about. What I like to say is that we need to learn from the local because we learn a lot locally. I'm learning so much through the Camden work, more than I've ever learned in the work in South Africa, in the Vatican, and so on. But the ambition has to be to scale it up, to learn from the local, scale up the, those lessons. So if you change how procurement works in Camden, what does it look like to change the procurement nationally or think globally in terms of how we fight some sort of plastic-free oceans agenda, which has to be global, in terms of the lessons on procurement. So we, we need to resist, I think, that is it local, is it global? But what's really interesting about both what Kate talks about, but also my own experience and practice is that it's the local situations where we learn the most. And that's, by the way, why we've just set up a, a new council for the United Nations with city mayors, it's called the, Count, the UN Council on Urban Initiatives. Oh, I shouldn't be announcing it. It's not announced yet. But anyway, hey, this is the first time I announce it. It's going to be announced in a couple months uh, with global mayors and designers and architects kind of thinking together what the SDGs mean for their cities and bringing, again, citizens to the table for what it means literally for their street. But at the same time, I'm chairing something for the World Health Organization, which is a council, an economics council on health for all. Because the problem with economics, and I'm an economist, is that at best what we do with economics and health, and, and Kate can tell me if she agrees, is that we say, oh, invest in health, invest in health systems, invest in people's well-being, and guess what? It's going to be good for the economy. And that's an important point, but we try to reverse that. We say, no, 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 hold on. Invest in health for all as the objective and backtrack. What does it mean for the economy? What does it mean for how you do procurement? What does it mean for how you set up development banks and so financing institutions? What does it mean for public-private partnerships? So you focus on the goal and ask, what does it mean for the economy? And by the way, this council, which has been announced, is only women. <laughs> and I'll stop there. What do you think? Yeah, that's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think what does this COVID moment tell us about the need for international cooperation? A lot. A lot. It's a, it's a huge wake up call. But how easily is that cooperation derailed by somebody exercising power in a, in a iniquitous way? You know, Donald Trump taking America out of the World Health Organization, or one country refusing to sort of sign up to to a global agreement around um, carbon emissions. It's so difficult to to get that international collaboration right, but so vital that we do it. And we do have to sort of do it, I suppose, with the humility of recognizing that quite often those big international organizations make mistakes and get things wrong. Um, and if we don't do that, then it makes it, it, it makes it too easy for those who are opposed to that kind of collaboration to point the finger and say, oh, well, they didn't prevent the COVID pandemic or they didn't, they didn't tackle, tackle this issue. And so there needs to be a sort of a, a level of humility around the, the capability at international collaborative level to make things change. But it but it is so important, you know, it's important. How are we going to manage global financial inequality 
if we don't have global cooperation around taxing transactions, for example, or getting rid of um, offshore tax havens. We just can't do it without that international collaboration. Um, how are we going to tackle the next pandemic? Yeah, if we don't have a strong World Health Organization that we all trust. Um, so those things really are, are vital. And I suppose, yeah, things start local and, and examples can sort of trickle up. And, and one, one, one thing I've found over and over is real useful sort of tool for working with policymakers and politicians is to describe somewhere where everything's happening really well, like you want it to go. You know, you could describe a country where all good things are happening or describe a city. And then what you say is like, well, this is, this is happening. It's just not all happening in the same place. So if you're talking about a city, you might say, well, in Camden, this is happening. And in Amsterdam, they're doing this great thing. And in Manchester, they're doing this great thing. How about if we did all of those things in the same place? And I think that helps focus people on pos on the possibility. It stops things feeling too utopian. If you can point to great case studies, great examples of policies, actions, um, where things are happening on the ground and making a difference for people, I think that's a really, really useful tool. One, I mean, I hate to be the the like black cloud here, but I mean, the problem with all this is it requires money. Um, and while the governments were great at throwing money at people when they thought the markets were collapsing, um, how soon do you think we lose the, the enthusiasm of that? And you already hear Larry Summers in the U.S. warning of inflation, stop spending, and the Republicans refusing to consider infrastructure. How realistic is it to think that we will actually spend the money we need to spend? What do you guys think? It's incredible that Larry Summers, I hate to say this, is still being listened to. I mean, um, go back to what he was saying just before the financial crisis. It helped cause it. So this idea that you know government investment and spending and recovery funds are going to cause inflation is completely wrong. What it depends on is whether that funding is structured in a proper way or not. And this fear about government funding actually creates a self-fulfilling prophecy that we end up just worrying about the quantity and not the quality. So as long as what government is doing is expanding the pie, and that's about the rate of change. What we should also care about is the direction. So sustainable growth, inclusive growth. But let me just focus a minute on the kind of siloed way that economists think. As, think, as long as we're investing in all those areas that produce long-run growth, that increase productivity, long-run drivers of economic growth, so research and development, education, health and well-being of people so we don't pick up the mess afterwards, that actually increases the GDP pie. So debt to GDP actually stays in check. What you don't want is just to flood the system with liquidity and not expand the pie because it's not landing on structures. That will cause inflation, right? Second, you know, as both Kate and I already said, the last thing you want to do is just hand out kind of random money and not actually solve problems. So both the point of solving the problems at hand, but also investing in all those areas we know produce long-run growth a, won't cause inflation, but also will keep debt to GDP in check in the long run. I'm from Italy. Italy has a very, very high debt to GDP ratio and a low deficit. So even just basic economic, like, you know, common sense isn't out there when people like Larry Summers just worry about public budgets. If you don't invest as a government in things that matter, your deficit might be relatively low, like two, three, four percent. It's not a big deal but your GDP is not rising. So in theory, just remember your basic math for those that took any sort of math class, when zero is in the denominator of any ratio, the number goes to infinity. So you can have this ironic situation where your debt to GDP ratio is almost at infinity with a low deficit. <laughs> Sorry for that quick you know, math lesson, but that would be super useful to hear on, you know, in, in the media. And unfortunately, what I'm hearing at the local level, and I, you know, I work very closely with Georgia Gould, who's the leader in Camden Council, we co-chair the Camden Renewal Commission, is that they're already hearing, oh, fine, you put in all this money now, the government, but soon you're going to have to share the burden. And sharing the burden, burden sharing is austerity. And we know that the 10 years of austerity that we had in the UK post-financial crisis, where we penalized people instead of the banks and, and the private sector that caused the crisis, led to a much, much weaker social fabric that meant that the current COVID pandemic had a much bigger effect on even economic growth, let alone human suffering, than it had to have. 
So big message, do not, under any circumstances, do austerity again. It's a crime. It's a crime against humanity. And it also reduces, in the long run, economic growth. But first, focus on people. Okay, well, your thoughts? Yeah, well, I'm not an economist, and, and so can't can't reply. But what always strikes me is, as a non-economist, how governments find the money to do the things they want to yeah. do. And sometimes they say, oh, well, somebody's going to have to pay for this in the end. But actually, they don't. Um, and, of course, what they spend it on is driven by ideology. So when our government decides that it wants to protect the constituencies in the north of England that it has managed to capture from traditional Labour voters, then it says, oh, we're going to have a levelling up agenda and we're going to spend some money up there. And it spends it only in the Tory towns, you know, if you you look at where it's actually gone. It isn't a levelling up agenda. It is a political agenda, but money is going in there. So, So governments always find the money to do the things they want to do, but they spend on the things they want to spend. And they take advantage of the fact that the media and the public think that the country's budget is like a household budget. And that's Margaret Thatcher's fault, isn't it? I mean, she told us that that the country's budget is like a household budget and, you know, you can't spend what you haven't got and she's good at managing her shopping, so therefore she's good at managing the country. And, And we also believe that and we haven't got away from that in, I think, our public understanding and in our journalism and so you don't hear those ideas challenged that somebody's going to have to pay for this. Someone is going to have to repay what we've spent on the pandemic. We're going to have to have austerity because we've spent a lot of money. We've seen our government cut the overseas development budget, including the money for research that is conducted in overseas development. Um, basically, because they said, well, COVID's, COVID's been expensive for us, so we haven't got that money anymore. And that is both pursuing their their ideological agenda, but it's also short-termism, as Marianne is describing. And and the idea that if you invest in those long-run drivers of good stuff, that you're wasting money or you're not not being um, economically responsible is obviously wrong. But but I think the way people talk about economics in this country is, is very narrow. But by the way, every time we have a war, and we've had many, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, have you ever heard a government say, oh, sorry, we can't go. Can't afford that one. We wanted to go, but we can't. There's no tax revenue. They create the money, at least when you have a sovereign currency. Let's you know, forget when you're in the euro and et cetera, but it, definitely for the British pound and the US dollar, they create the money when they go to war. But what's interesting is because they treat it as urgent, they also create a system, the military industrial complex, right? So it's not enough just to say, hey, this matters, the health pandemic, create the money. You have to create a health system. You need a system of innovation. You need active purpose-oriented organizations. That's why I've for years said we need an ARPA-H. Now, you know, the UK is talking about it, but led by kind of weird siloed thinking of big projects versus, you know, purposeful missions. But you need government structures on the ground, kind of a decentralized network of public organizations and private organizations that together go to war. But the social war, the social battles we have, the inequality battles. And so it's not enough actually to just create the money to fight that poverty battle or any sort of social battle. We need purposeful organizations. And we've just done a report through my institute. It's called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL for the BBC, because the BBC is such an interesting organization because it has thought about its internal metrics, the public value, public purpose. What does it mean for how a public organization makes choices of which programs it does? So PBS in the US just does the market failure thing, high quality news, great documentaries, but no soap operas, no talk shows. The fact the BBC did do soap operas, did do talk shows, but through a notion of public value, you know, EastEnders, not just Dallas and Dynasty for those people viewing who are older than 40, (laughs) Um, you know, mattered. It had to do with diversity. It had to do with social metrics. And that's where the challenge is. It can't just be create the money to do, you know, solve problems. We need able, capable, dynamic public organizations with metrics inside around public value and public purpose. And that's just as important as saying, you know, spend the money, invest. Mariana, have you... 
Sorry, oh. Marianne, have you figured out? Have you figured out those metrics and that measurement yet? Yeah, public value. I remember one time we met over breakfast, and, yeah. and and that was the point of discussion. Yeah, I mean, since then I, I set up this institute, uh, which is all around public value and public purpose, because the idea is, what does it actually mean to bring public purpose at the center of political economy, not just at the periphery of you know projects around health, the environment, innovation, at the center of how we think about economic growth? What does it mean for economic theory? What does it mean for practice? All, you know, all the questions that Brooke has been asking us for the kind of nitty gritty, what do we do? But that that learning on the ground of what do we actually do in Camden, Manchester, or in, you know, in the in the region of the Basque region of Spain, where we're working around the cooperatives, precisely as you said, Kate, to learn for the mutuals and the cooperatives, bring it back to the theory. That kind of feedback between theory and practice, and so public value. I mean, this the, this work we just did with the BBC, I find so interesting because they're the only organization I know globally. You know, they're massively under under attack. A, but B, globally, they have thought about public value. It's not enough to make, to, to have a public broadcaster. Like in Italy, we have RAI. In, in America, I mentioned PBS. But they're not actually delivering public value if the public don't watch it. Most people in America do not watch PBS. <laughs> Why? Because they've limited their role just to this little filling the gap. You know, just like public space. Is public space just filling the cracks of where you don't have private space? Or is it an objective? And even the fact that the public good Sounds good, right? Two words, one of which is good, but the public good in economics is literally filling the gap of what the private sector doesn't do. Whereas the common good is an objective, it's not a correction. So what does it mean to have as an objective to create public value versus just to fill the cracks, fill the gap, fill the market failure of what the private sector is not doing? I'm sorry, Brooke, we're going completely off tangent, but these are the big issues of our time. (laughs) I want to actually bring you back to practicalities with another audience question. This one's anonymous, but, you know, if we need these purpose-driven organizations, we need people in them who are, who think about missions and think about public value. And I would be interested in, and our audience member wants to know, does our current education system produce what we need? And if not, what do we need to do to change it? That's a great question. I mean, I mean, I think that the simple answer is no, it doesn't because, and it's, it's partly the problem of living in an unequal society. If you live in an unequal society, then money becomes much more salient and, and much more important. And young people focus more on ambitions that will bring them money and status. And, and so then you've got a, a focus within an education system, within a culture that actually is not fostering that breadth of contributions that, that we need in a balanced society. It's not encouraging young people to think creatively about how they make a contribution, what their sense of purpose is. Mm-hmm. Um, we were very struck when we were writing the spirit level sort of 10 years ago to find that the more unequal societies had more kids who said their ambitions were really, were really high. Um, and that, that gave us pause for thought for a while. And then we realized actually they wanted to be celebrities and pop stars. <laughs> they wanted to make a lot of money. They weren't actually thinking about um, uh, the kinds of contributions they might make that society needs. And so, so you get a very narrow sort of set of ambitions for young people in an unequal society. And our education system gets, gets, gets sort of locked into that as well. And it's all to do with grading and it's all to do with a particular kind of intellectual attainment. And we know that our societies need, need much more heterogeneous set of contributions from people. Um, we do need people who care for us. We do need people who take out the rubbish. We do need all those key workers that, that we suddenly had to, to, to focus on um, during the pandemic. And so we do need to think about a, a society that values all of the things it needs. And, and Marianne has written about this before I know about how, you know, if you get a private company that, that's created value around a particular idea and they sort of think it's all to do with them, but it's not because they've benefited from um, public investment in all the kinds of things that sort of, sort of made that possible. Yeah, can I just answer this as well? I think it's such a good question. Um, I would answer it really super briefly on three levels. One is exactly what Kate just said. 
if we confuse price with value, which we do, <laughs> I wrote a book on this called The Value of Everything, um, then we end up with this crazy situation where you have, you know, um, what's his name, Blank Fiend, the head of Goldman Sachs, saying just after the economic crisis, Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. And he's right. They are the most productive if you have this tautology where we confuse how much you're earning by how valuable you are. So health workers, essential workers, that's what we've called them during the COVID pandemic. We clap them on Thursdays or we're clapping them on Thursdays. It's an insult. It's an insult to clap essential workers and not knowing how to value their essential role. We haven't. For any worker, also a public school teacher, a state school teacher, I always forget not to say public in the UK for some reason, they confuse public and private. They literally call the public sector <laughs> the black press. I've never understood that. So public schools are or private schools in the UK. Anyway, so for any system which is public and free, we know how to value the input, which is the cost. We don't know how to value the output. So literally, that's why we talk about spending and not investing in public education and public health, because it's literally just a cost. We haven't valued the output, the ambitious output of a well-structured, ambitious, dynamic, creative health system and education system, which means more than just how much money you put in. But also, you know, I mean, one of the reasons I set up a whole institute, a department at UCL was precisely on this question. What is the education we need, the curriculum, the change in the curriculum you need inside the civil service if what we're talking about is co-creating and co-shaping markets to deliver key public objectives like inclusive and sustainable growth, that's not going to be public choice theory, new public management, which literally is the outcome of neoliberal economics from University of Chicago into the civil service, where you know, they even think that government failure is worse than, than market failure. So not only should you you know, fix the market failures, but be careful that might cause government failure. So take up as little space as possible and get out of the way. And lastly, I mean, I have the honor to be currently a PhD supervisor of George Mapanga, otherwise known as George the Poet, who is one of the most amazing individuals I've ever met. And he has this whole interesting theory that, you know, so many young black artists doing rap are creating huge amounts of value. A lot of these young artists end up actually in the criminal justice system. They, they are value creators. They have been completely excluded from how the economy values people. And so there's kind of two big objectives with this work. A, which is if you actually really unpack the whole kind of collective value creation around hip hop and rap, what would it look like if the value that comes from that is reinvested back into the community that created it? Social housing, you know, public art centers and so on. But also, how do we get rid of this myth that you know, value creation, wealth creation is just in places like Silicon Valley and venture capital, and at best can be redistributed to others through at best you know, some sort of you know, universal basic income? How do you actually start with the idea that value is genuinely created at the citizen level, at the human level, at the, at the youth level, and at the community level in the way that Kate was talking about, and actually use that to really increase people's confidence and ability in, in the way that Amartya Sen talks about, he says, you have no opportunities unless you have capabilities. And if we don't invest in those capabilities, which has to do with our social infrastructure, not just physical infrastructure, forget it. You know, globalization, digitalization, all these great things out there have no effect on your life chances if you yourself have not been invested in as a human being to be able to prosper and flourish. So the question's a great one. Um, you know, we could go on for hours because you guys are clearly great together and these are such important issues. However, there are other authors and other panels coming up. So I want to thank you guys for what it was clearly a really thoughtful discussion. And um, for and let's do this again. Maybe we should all have coffee or something and invite everyone to come. Thank you for joining us, both of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Kate. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks.